and thank oh, thanks uh, thanks Annabelle. Evening, everyone. Again, welcome uh, again to our evening celebration. Those of you here, those of you watching at home, sitting on your sofas at home in your PJs, you are very welcome to. I did have a random sort of thought that during uh, you know as a, an homage to lockdown that one Sunday we ought to just make it like PJ Sunday. <laughs> what do you reckon? <laughs> Not much enthusiasm for that here, although you at home, I'm sure you're, you're, you're already way ahead of us. So um, maybe just uh, not every thought is from God, is it? So there we go. <laughs> Here are a few thoughts that I hope are, as we think a little bit about, we're sort of drawing to a close in this sermon series entitled Freedom in Christ. And tonight I'm going to talk a little bit about truth over lies. Uh, Last week, Tom spoke to us about exercising our authority. I wonder how that's been going this week. I know that today there's a few people been praying in various contexts around the church, doing just that. I wonder how that's been going in your own life as you've been praying, exercising authority, uh, all, the, all that Jesus gives you, and using that as we pray. I wonder how that's been working out for you. Last week, uh, Tom spoke about that. Over the previous few weeks, we had a whole lot of, um, I was going to say a whole lot of talking, but you know what I mean, a lot of, a lot of uh, encouragement in terms of thinking about what it means to be free as Christians, free as people in following the Lord. We thought about our spiritual battle. We've had, in a sense, four little stages. One is about recognizing those challenges that we face. Secondly, we've thought about repenting. That simply means turning around and leaving behind um, unhelpful thoughts or patterns. Last week, we were thinking about rebuking. So, in a sense, taking our place in saying no. We, we will not do this. We will follow the Lord and we will, uh, we will uh, seek him. And to, tonight we begin a, a two-week series, if you like, about replacing. What can we practically do to live differently in our life in a, in a way that gives Jesus the glory, enables us to follow him more closely? And we're thinking a little bit about truth over lies. This recognizes the reality that in our, in our lives, we have several voices going on at the same time, not in a kind of a weird schizophrenic way, but in our lives, we, uh, as we go about our daily business, there's the stuff that, if you're a Christian following Jesus, that you know that God says about you. There's the things that other people say about you, or maybe even to you. And there's that stuff that we say to ourselves that we either pick up because other people have spoken into us, or because we've grown up in a a, a, a pattern of doing life where the negativity of the things that we speak to ourselves dominates. And tonight we're going to think about how do we replace some of that stuff, the lies with the truth. I love this thing that John F. Kennedy said. This is going back, obviously, um, into the 60s, early 60s. He said this, no matter how big the lie, repeat it often enough and the masses will regard it as the truth. It's an interesting uh, phrase, isn't it, from a politician I wonder how many still believe that to be true. The more often you speak something, the louder you say it, then maybe everybody simply believes it as the truth, even if it isn't. I think part of that is true in our own lives, actually, that we believe a whole load of things about ourselves, and we keep believing them as as the truth without really focusing in on the lies that affect us, and we've simply taken them on board. How many of us were told when we were kids, you're stupid? And people live life believing that they are, that we are, simply because somebody said it to us when we were seven years old. How many of us believe you'll never amount to anything? 
We take on board lies framed by our own experience of the world around us. And we need to take some responsibility for replacing the lies with the truth. Tom spoke last week about um, that dynamic of exercising our authority. You may remember his he, he, second point was about being curious. You know, what is, what is going on in any situation that we face in life? Where is God at work? Where is the enemy at work? Remember, you may remember that if you were here last week. If you missed the talk, um, it's well worth catching up on it. And sometimes in my, in my own life, I've been caught up with the things that I think in my head or the things that others have said to me or the, the, the way that I perceive myself, I, I can get caught up in wondering where a thought came from in a way that isn't very healthy. So where did that thought come from? Is it a thought that's come from God? It is, a, is it a thought that's come from other people? Is it just a thought that's popped into my own mind? And I can be caught up with thinking where a thought came from. And then I came across this little bit from a guy called Steve Fertick, uh, kind of a young pastor in the States. He said this, he said, you can spend your time unhelpfully wondering where a thought came from, or you can pay attention to where it leads you. I thought that was such helpful insight this week. And maybe if that's the only thing you remember tonight. The thoughts that you have about yourself, where do they lead you? Do they lead you to a place where you feel better about life? Where you feel good about yourself? Where you feel more called or more loved by the Lord? Do the thoughts lead you there? Or do they lead you to a place that's different from that? Think about tonight as, we, as you listen to me talk, and there'll be various thoughts in your own head, won't there? Some, some of the things, some of you will be thinking, what am I going to be doing in, in 48 minutes' time when Sai finishes? Um, some of you will already be there as you're thinking about what's going to happen next. Some of you will be, will be yearning for, you know, a glass of um, orange squash when when I finish later on, or time in the pub. Some of you will already be there, but pay attention, if you could, to your own thought patterns about what you think about yourself. Not just in a sort of a selfish, it's all about me kind of way, but where do those thoughts lead you? Where do they take you? And tonight, as we look at some... (laughs) As we look at... um, for those of you who didn't pick that up, uh, up online, um, the, a, a small person over to my left just went, uh-oh. <laughs> um, which is a brilliant summary of what I'm going to say <laughs> this evening, actually. Um, so point one is, uh-oh. <laughs> point two might involve a series of raspberries all in one go, but just, <laughs> just go with it this evening. Um, We're going to look at this passage from Philippians 4 as we think about our focus. What do we need to look at or think about that enables us to replace lies with truth? Here's this passage from Philippians 4. If you've got your Bible with you, you might want to turn it on. And um, this is what this passage said. This is a guy called Paul writing to a bunch of early Christians in a place called Philippi. Hence the name of the book is the Philippians. And he writes to them and he says this. Finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable. If anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. Whatever you've learnt or received or heard from me or seen in me, put into practice and the God of peace will be with you. Interesting, isn't it? That word that was shared earlier on about peace rising up here in the auditorium like smoke covering us. The God of peace will be with you. So, truth and lies. How do we do life Live it in the way that we start to be healthier people, living under the truth of who we are, and not just caught up in believing lies 
about ourselves. Here are some lies that I think uh, come sometimes masquerade as truth in my life. And some of this might be, might be a bit of a shock to you, but um, we're caught out by lies that masquerade as truth. <laughs> Interesting. I'm hearing an echo of, of myself. Here's, here's the first lie. Your life will not make a difference. It's a lie that finds its way in in various guises and various ways. It sometimes is focused in on the kind of work that you're doing or the stuff that your life is focused towards. Lie number one, your life will not make a difference. How many of us have ever thought that about what you're doing currently, about who you are as a person? Your life doesn't make a difference. Lie number two is this. You are not dot, 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 enough. You are not young enough. You are not good enough. You are not holy enough. You are not talented enough. You are not bright enough. You are not enough. I wonder how many of us are caught up with that, that sense of you are not enough. It's one of the things that uh, that we come across more than anything else when you start to involve people in the life of ministry, actually, in the context of church. It's only one small part of life, but when when we start to say to folks, you know, what about, you know, getting involved or helping? And often we find ourselves saying, you know, I'm I'm not holy enough. Or, I don't know enough. It's one of the things that people say most when you say, could you let's come and help with the Alpha course, leading a group, and people say, I I don't know enough. You are not enough is a lie that masquerades as truth. Thirdly, and here's a biggie, you are not as good as dot, dot, dot. Pick the person of your choice. Now, sometimes, you know, I find myself working in in church a a lot, um, and these apply in that context. But if you think about it in the context of your workplace or your family life, your life will not make a difference. You're not enough. You're not as good as dot, dot, dot. Comparison is a killer, isn't it? We look at other people's lives and we're focused towards that because of the culture in which we live. You know, whether the, you know, you're an Insta addict or a Twitter follower or Facebook old person. Um, Whatever it is, we're focused towards looking at and observing other people's lives in a way that says, you know, either wow or I'm glad that isn't me. We are focused on comparison. And I found the biggest killer in life for me is the comparison. And actually, in terms of church leadership, it's the comparison looking at other people's churches or other people's lives, other people's families. How many of you looked at another family and thought, wow, they seem to have it all together. They've got it all sorted. Where does that thought lead you? Does it lead you to a place where your family becomes more healthy or more focused or more loving or more caring? Probably not, actually. The comparison does not lead us to a great place. Where does that thought lead you? Three lies that masquerade as truths. And here we are back to this passage from Philippians chapter 4. And one of the things that Paul says as he gave advice to this church about thinking about themselves well and thinking about the way that they might serve in their community well He said this, he said, focus on the right places. 
If anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. Think about such things. All of us in life have a, an experience of life. The things that have happened to us that enable us to think well of ourselves or, or not. To think positively about ourselves or about circumstances or not. We all have a, a lens that we look at life through. Some of which has been affected by the good stuff that has happened to us and some of it has been, has been, affects us because it's been a negative thing that happened to us. And we then frame life in that kind of way. Let's have a little look at um, this lovely picture over here. We all frame life in a particular way. I know, don't say it. We all have a frame that we look through. And that frame is, everybody has one. We look at it, life through a frame, and the frame is formed by family, by our genetics, what we're like as people, what our parents were like, whether our parents were present or absent, whether we were loved or not, whether we were hurt, cared for, abused. We all look at life through those lenses. Everybody has one. And here's what the framing will do for us. It frames not just the way that people look at us, but it frames the way that we look at others. It also frames the way that we look at the world around us and the circumstances of life that we face. So, for example, and this may be, this may be you, you look at this picture of the world. It's a lovely photo painting thing, isn't it? It's on the, I've stolen it from the wall of my office. This is a beautiful and expensive painting made by a, a Swedish artist called Ikea. <laughs> Beautifully done, don't you think? When you look at this painting, you can frame it in a particular way. You can frame it uh, as a whole like that. Most of us are looking at life through our frame, and we, we frame it in particular ways. So do you find yourself focusing in on the dark sections, the shadows, where there is no light, where you can only see uh, tree trunks and nothing else? Is that you as a person? Do you find that as your focus? Do you start with life with what will not be possible? What may not happen? Where things might go wrong? And yet you can frame this slightly differently, can't you? You can frame it here where the light is shining where the sun is coming through the trees, where there seems to be a sense of hope, perspective, warmth. Most of us will frame this picture in one way or another. If we could go through the room tonight, or for you at home, and ask you, where does your framing start? I wonder where you might place your frame of life. We all have a frame. We have no uh, say sometimes over the way that that frame comes to us. But we do have a, a say about what we can do about it. Some of us will find in some of our days that we start down here or up here. Some of us will find every day that your frame is like that. Those are called, in theological terms, annoying people. <laughs> Bless you if, you if you're like that as a person. We think you're fantastic, but just wish we could be a bit more like you. Um, 
how you frame the world will affect how you think about yourself and how you think about others and what God might call you to. God will never use me. This day is going to be dreadful. Where will things go wrong? Lord, what do you have for me this day, this week? Help me to see you in it. And what I've discovered in my own life, in terms of thinking about these things, it says in this verse, that are excellent and praiseworthy. Most of you, when I read that verse a minute ago, went, how, how lovely, but not applicable. Because you won't do anything about it, probably. What I'm suggesting is that we absolutely do. And one of the things, one of the ways that we can focus on what is excellent or praiseworthy is to reframe how we see the day, how we see life. And maybe one of the ways that you can move from down here to up here is is how about thanking God for the things that didn't happen that you thought might. I got in the car tonight and I... I got here safely. I didn't crash. That's different, isn't it, from as I step into the car, I'm worried that I I might. Or what if the, what if the, how many of you have done a journey where you start thinking, what if the tyres burst? And yet, what if we started the journey with, or ended the journey with, thank you, Lord, that the tyres didn't burst. I got here. How we frame the world of our days will affect the way that we perceive ourselves and others. You see, the lie says life is always going to be like that. And all of us, if we're honest, know that we have moments like that, don't we? Maybe even days or months or years where this seems the way that the world works out for us. Yet I think incrementally, a life that says, I will keep going nonetheless, I will live life in a way that praises the Lord, I will focus on those excellent, praiseworthy things, enables us to reframe our thinking in a way that blesses others and helps us focus on the right places. If anything is excellent or praiseworthy, Scripture says, think about such things. Take a moment right now. What is excellent or praiseworthy in your life? There will be something, and you might have to dig for it, but what is it? Those of you sitting here, those of you at home, those of you that dozed off, Those of you that have got caught up in scrolling, pause. What's excellent or praiseworthy that you could focus on right now? Secondly, focus on the right people. Whatever you have learnt or received or heard from me, Paul wrote, put into practice. Focus on the right people. Who are we hanging out with? Who are we spending time with? Who might we learn from, be encouraged by? It's one of the reasons why we do life groups like we do, or any of the small groups that we run, whether it's Alpha or Kintsugi, Hope. We do all of that so that we can hang out with people that will not pretend that every single day is is like that. But who will recognize where they are and want to reframe life and thinking in a way that leads to positivity. Whatever you've learned or received or heard from me, focus on the right people. Because the right people will enable something of the right thinking. Do you have people in your life, in my life, who will speak truth 
about who you are. We'll see the things in you that are a blessing to others. And we'll, in a sense, call it out from you. To say, you can do it. Step towards this. You can do more than you think you can. Focus on the right people. Paul was encouraging this church to do exactly that. And maybe we could learn from that. So this week, focus on the right places. What's excellent or praiseworthy. Maybe enable each day not to think about where things might go wrong, but to thank God for where they didn't. Focus on the right places. Focus on the right people. And thirdly, focus on the right practice. Paul was able to say to this church, whatever you've seen in me or heard from me, put it into practice and the God of peace will be with you. It's one of the lovely and amazing things about following Jesus is that following him is a practical following. It's a what will I do? How will the impact of what I think about myself affect the way that I put into practice serving other people? And here's one, I think it's immutable truth. It's that if you think negatively about yourself a lot, it will always find a way out and affect others. Always. You can't think negatively about yourself most of the time and then suddenly expect that people will experience you as full of joy or life or whatever it is that you hope that they might see. So Paul says put into practice some of these things. Put into practice focusing in on the right place. What's excellent or praiseworthy. Focus in on the right people. Who will I have in my life that I can really be honest with and say, do you know what? I'm really struggling with this. I struggle about the way that I think about myself. I struggle with the way that I think about others. I struggle with negativity or depression or whatever it may be in our lives. Can we focus on the right people that will enable us to share honestly about that stuff? And then can we put into practice whatever we've learned? One of the great learning curves for me in life, having lived a relatively sheltered life, I think it would be fair to say, um, at the age of 19 or 20, was working with the Julian Trust in the centre of Bristol. I spent a, a few years working with them, working with homeless people in the centre of uh, our uh, amazing city. It gave me a sense of compassion, I think. It made me realise that everybody is actually only about three steps away from being homeless. It made me realise that some people who are homeless have actually chosen that and therefore don't be a patronising person to just assume that um, everybody needs a help help up. But it helped me to put into practice and in putting into practice something it, it reframed my thinking of the world, it reframed my understanding of what it meant to be a Christian and it reframed the way that my life was to pan out. Now, it'll be different for all of us, I think, in terms of what, where we might practice. And we might start in church. If you've yet to find a place in serving somewhere in church, why not talk to one of us afterwards? I'm sure we can find space. If you have particular technical skills and you're great, you love a good computer, um, you know your way around an iPad um, like nobody else. I mean, other devices are available. I mean, not as good, but are, are available then maybe there's a place for you to get stuck in and to serve. You can start here. There'll be opportunities with our mission partners 
There'll be stuff going on all around our communities and across the world. If you want to reframe your life, maybe start with putting into practice those things that you have heard. Putting into practice your Christian life. And as you do that, you will reframe it. It's not like everything becomes perfect or this is glued in over here. We'll have, of course, moments in all of our lives. But we just start to reframe. Help me to think positively about this. Help me to think praiseworthy on praiseworthy things. Help me to think about what didn't happen that I feared might happen. Help me to give you thanks, Lord, when things go well. Help me to praise you even in the midst of my depression. We start to frame the world, not as some kind of immovable object, but as something that can refocus our attention to live appropriately. We can replace over here with up here one thought at a time. Focus on these things. Put into practice the people that helped on the summer club over the, over the last few weeks. I've heard lots of people describe how exhausting it was, and it was. But I've not heard anybody say, I wish I, wish I hadn't bothered serving on it. Something happens when we practice our Christian faith. Something happens when we live it out. Something happens when you take a step in the direction of serving others and being a blessing in our communities. Something happens that replaces the lies that we think about ourselves with something of the truth. Jesus said, and it's taken slightly out of context, but in John 8, he said, you'll know the truth and the truth will set you free. I think that means something about as we focus towards what God thinks we're like, then we will become freer people. What do you see? Those of you at home, you can post it in the chat. Those of you here, what do you see? Colours? Any idea? An angry badger. There is going to be special prayer and ministry available for Clarky. Yeah, angry bad. Yeah, we'll see. But what? Any any other? What do you see? Blood. Blood. What do you see? Some of you saw that, didn't you? But you were just a bit bit worried about calling it out. As we focus on the right places, what's excellent and praiseworthy, as we focus on the right people, as we focus on the right practice, we get to see more of Jesus in our lives. We get to be called out by him again. We get to move towards him. And we get to understand how he sees us. If you want three questions that will help you refocus your attention away from the lies and towards the truth, it's this. Number one, what does God say about himself? As you read scripture, what does it say Jesus is like? I am the way. I am the truth. I am the life. I am the gate. What does God say about himself? I am the God who loves you. If you want a second question, not just what does God say about himself, but here's the the biggie. What does God say about me, about you? He says you can do more than you could ever ask or imagine. He says that you are greatly loved. He says that you are significant. He says that you are holy. 
He says that you are enough. He says that you are unique. He says that you're called. If you want to reframe something of your thinking, I would suggest these three questions might be good ones to start with. What does God say about himself? What does God say about me? And then what does God say I can do? We had a bit of that last week, didn't we? All authority in heaven on earth is given to Jesus, and then he says, now you go and make disciples of all nations. What does he say that I can do? He says that I can speak and say a few things about him. I can share hope. I can stand alongside the broken and the hurting and make a difference. My story can count. My damage in my life can impact somebody else that will be helpful for them. The negative things that have happened to me don't need to hold me back. That I could never say that to anybody. The difficult things in your life, the reality is God says I can turn them around and make a blessing out of them for somebody else. The lie says we're trapped back here. I was hurt, abused, damaged. This is only the way that I can see the world. It's the only way that I can cope with being framing the world around me. This happened to me, so this is where I end up. I don't think that's God's voice. I think God says it's awful that you were hurt. He says it's dreadful that you were abused, abandoned in whatever way you were, and that none of that was actually good or right or his purposes in any way. But what he says is, I can do, through, take all things, bring good to you, even out of the most painful of situations. So that your story of hurt, abuse, abandonment, discouragement, whatever it may be, might be somebody else's light, through which they might be able to frame the world in a different way. Your honest story can make the difference. What does God say I can do? I can be me. I can share who I am and all that he has done in me. And I can pray that even the most difficult things in my life might in the end be a blessing both to me and maybe to somebody else. The lie says it won't make a difference. Jesus says it really can. Someone else might be positively affected even through the most difficult of circumstances that you have faced and been through. What does God say about himself? He loves us. What does he say about me? He says, Simon, you are loved. There's no one else in the world like you. There's purposes that I have for you, even at your great age. What does God say I can do? He, said, he says, Simon, you can be strengthened to follow me and to live for me. Your life can count. Your stories, even the most difficult of things, can be a blessing to others. And in all of that, the kingdom story is of transformation. It's of replacement. It's of what looked like it was going to be negative actually turning out for our and others' blessing. Only Jesus can do that. Only Jesus makes that happen. Isn't that an amazing part of the gospel narrative? Only Jesus can do that. So, a story of replacement. Jesus calls us to focus on the right places. If anything is excellent or praiseworthy, why don't you try that this week? To focus on the right people. Share your story with somebody else. Look for those that will draw out of you what God has put in. And thirdly, focus on the right practice. Get stuck in somewhere. And maybe use these three questions throughout this week to help you frame your understanding of Scripture and all that he has called us to do. Why don't we stand as we pray together?
And just bring yourself before the Lord in this moment. Whatever's come to mind for you, maybe it's a circumstance or a situation that's only known to you and to Jesus. Maybe it's something that's just popped into your head right now. Maybe the old lies have started to invade even whilst you've been listening to what's been said this evening. Lies like, that can't be true for you. Or you always think like that. Whatever those things are in this moment, just bring them to the Lord right now. And Holy Spirit, we offer you ourselves. We say, come, Lord Jesus, fill us up afresh. Where we are tonight, whether we're at home watching, whether we're here in the room, we say, come, Lord Jesus, do the things in us and through us that you want to do. Help us to focus in the right places this week. To be encouraged by the right people and to put into place the right practice in our lives. Lead us into these things, we pray. And if you're here tonight and you've been thinking to yourself, I want my story to count, and it particularly applies to the difficulties that you have faced growing up or the things that have become negative you've believed negative things about yourself because you were abandoned or your parents weren't there for you or you were hurt in one way or another if you want your story to count I'm going to suggest that you might just come and stand with one or two of the prayer team this evening just let them pray for you for God's blessing on you somebody here it might be that whole Romans 8 28 thing of all things work together for good for those who love the Lord it doesn't say that everything that happens to us will be good it just says that God has a plan of bringing good even out of what's most painful and sometimes even specifically through what is painful if that's you tonight why not pause in a moment and just come for prayer if you're part of the prayer ministry team if you'd like to come and take your place that would be great and I've got a picture in my head of somebody being hurt or shouted at on a bus if that's you we'd love to pray for you I've got a picture of somebody as sort of like a 10 year old child just sitting with your head in your hands and there are voices kind of shouting over you if that's you, we'd love to pray for you. Exercise the authority of Jesus in these things. If you're a person that always seems to see the, the dark end of the trees over here, the shaded area, and you'd like to take a step towards thinking about what is excellent or praiseworthy, just come and stand with someone and we'll pray. this raises an element of fear in you because it means change or letting go of thought patterns or sometimes we can hug the negativity as a familiar friend and yet maybe the Lord wants us just to gently let go if that's you we'd love to pray 